This morning we're going to be in Romans chapter 2, starting with verse 11. And three Sundays ago, the message was titled, Boomerang Judgment. We covered the first part of Romans 2, which is very interesting because if you didn't get it, and you've ever been judged by somebody and you felt just really uncomfortable, uh, it's a great and comforting scripture to have because God didn't appoint anybody on this planet to look around and start judging other people. <laughs> so, boomerang judgment, I named it that because like a boomerang, if you, have, if you have a critical spirit and you're just constantly judging people, God in his word says that he, that's sinful, sinful behavior. Uh, this morning, the message is titled, False Foundations, and basically, we can look at false foundations in the world, we can look at things in the observable planet, and see through feats of engineering, if we want to look at the first slide, most people are familiar with that, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I did some study on that, and the foundation was actually built in a silty type of soil, which is sand and Jesus spoke about that. Apparently the builders didn't read Matthew 7 before they built that building. <laughs> so if we go from bad to worse, the second image is, uh, that's pretty bad, isn't it? You wouldn't want that to be your home, um, collapsing, and again, because of a false foundation. Uh, sometimes you see these at the shore. What did Jesus say? He made this incredible parallel that if your spiritual house is built on the rock and not the sand, the winds and the storms can come and the structure can survive. So in the observable world, if there's a problem with the foundation, when it starts getting battered, it starts to look like that. And the last stage in not a good foundation is, I don't think that's real, but I thought it was funny, so I figured I would put it up there. <laughs> you certainly don't want your home to look like that. Now, the Apostle Paul, of course, speaks about foundation spiritually. Jesus speaks about foundation spiritually. And that's really the context with which we're going to speak about this morning. And we're going to look at this in four parts. So jumping in verse 11, Apostle Paul says, For there is no partiality, there's no favoritism with God. For as many have sinned without the law, will also perish without the law. And as many have sinned in the law, you know, the law of God, Ten Commandments, and, and the expanded law, will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles, who do not have the law by nature, do the things contained in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So one out of four is God's judgment for sin is a perfect system. So he starts out with saying there's no partiality. And this is why God's word is timeless because in whatever time period you're looking at, the Bible is always applicable. There's no partiality. You know, 2,000 years later, people still don't like to hear that. Uh, some think that they're special, they think even their denomination is special, uh, their ethnicity, they're this, they're that, and God says, I don't show favoritism. When I judge, I do it righteously, I do it perfectly. I have to laugh that even in Calvary Chapel, which we are, uh, I've heard some say, oh yeah, they go to church, but they don't go to a Calvary. Okay, they go to a good Bible teaching church, then you shouldn't have that attitude. You know what I'm saying? So there is no partiality with God, period. He doesn't play favorites. In verse 12, he says, if you're a Jew and you have the law. Now, this is hard for us to comprehend in our culture some 2,000 years later because times have changed. And if I could put a little context into it, uh, in the Greco-Roman world, the, you had the Jews who were a minority who were true believers in Yahweh, in God, the one God. And the Greco-Roman culture had their pantheon of gods. They were polytheists. So you were either back then spiritually a Jew who was a, a, someone who knew God based on the history, the law, the miracles, and everybody else who kind of had like these false gods. The cool thing about that Jew and Gentile relationship where there were penny, plenty of people who actually became Jews even though they were pagans because they adopted the monotheistic God. They worshiped you know, Rahab and, and Ruth and all these other wonderful people 
uh, even found themselves in the bloodline of the Messiah, even though they started out as pagans. So really neat thing. So look at this Jew and Gentile thing, and if it makes it easier to swallow, you could look at believer, unbeliever. So he says, if, you have, if you're a Jew and you have the law, God will judge you by the law. That's a little scary when you think about it. So basically, I have all these, the Ten Commandments plus the additional commandments, and uh, gee, I'm going to be judged by whether I keep the law or not. But he says the Gentiles, if they don't have the law, God will still judge them. There's good news in this, by the way. He's, he, the Apostle Paul just, he set things up, you know, and then he gave the wonderful uh, you know, solution at the end. So if you're a Gentile and you don't have the law, you're not Jewish, you're still going to be judged by the conscience or the heart law that he put in every person. See, now that's an interesting concept, the heart law or the conscience. So the Gentiles, you know, they see creation, Romans tells us, they know that there's a God, you see complexity in life, uh, but they don't necessarily have the Ten Commandments. However, if you find me any remote civilization on the planet, whether it was back then or today, I will find you a group of people, even though the rest of the advanced world has not found them, that they have a code that they live by. Don't kill your neighbor. Don't steal your neighbor's livestock. Right, I'm saying? So you look at the entire world and there's this code. Whether they have the law or not, God has given us all a conscience, which is pretty a, neat, a pretty neat thing, I believe, um, that, that is supposed to help to guide us. So God uses various methods. If we go through the entire chapter, God judges according to truth, according to conscience, according to law, according to deeds, according to motives. And basically, all sinners are condemned to eternal destruction without a savior. So let me get to that part. Now, some even, so you got Paul who starts out as a rabbi. He's a Pharisee. He's Jewish. He's a genius. He studies under Gamaliel. You can find him in your history books. And he has this experience with the living God. He meets Christ on the road to Damascus and he becomes a believer. So now he's trying to win his, his clique, so to speak. You know, and I've been there, you've been there, right? You come to the faith in, in God. I mean, you have an experience with God, you know it. You want to go back and tell all your friends about this God. Now, some of Paul's friends were obstinate, they were overeducated. So, when you read the scripture and how he's preaching to them, it's a little terse, it's a little sharp, it's a little pointed. But with some, some people, they need that, right? Um, now remember, Paul is speaking to the Romans, but these letters went outside the church. So he was speaking to, he's speaking to everybody, right? But just in this one section, when he speaks about his fellow Jews, he's speaking about those that don't know Christ yet. He's also speaking to those Jews who have accepted Christ, but are still relying on the law, which is a false foundation, because they didn't make the full transition. So it's very interesting as you read what he says in this. We can also make applications to religion. Religion doesn't save. Many hide behind religion, and they, they you know, put all their eggs in one basket, so to speak, and hope that when they die, God is pleased with them. But Jesus makes it very clear in the judgment. We either knew him, we had a relationship with him, or we didn't. And the cool thing is everybody on the planet can know him. That's why God appoints crazy people like me up at this pulpit to tell you things like that, right? So it's, it's a, a very wonderful message. It's a blessed message, but you've got to follow God's way. We can't follow our ways. You know, Christ was God's attempt to come down and reach man. Religion is often man's attempt to go up and reach God on his own merits. It doesn't work like that. Warren Wiersbe, actually, who's gone to be with the Lord, they called him the pastor's pastor. I have many of his commentaries he passed away uh, very recently, this past week, and he said on the subject, it's not the possession of the law or God's word or the scripture or the Bible on your coffee table that matters, but the practice of it. I added a bunch of stuff there with a parenthesis. So, um, so that's what he said about the situation. Verse 13, it's not only the hearers, but the doers of God's word or of the law. James 1 tells us that faith obeys God's word. You know, there's plenty in the culture, and I'll just... I'll just take this and 2,000 years later apply it to the Christian culture. There's many in the Christian culture who do a lot of hearing but not a lot of doing. So in, in back in those days, the, the Jews were like, well, we're the chosen people. Even their rabbis taught that God would, and not all the rabbis, 
that God would teach on two standards or God would judge on two standards. And he would give the Jewish people, the chosen people, a pass. And what Paul is saying, God doesn't show favoritism. He's not biased. He's not prejudiced. It's not going to work like that. As a matter of fact, it's the reverse. For those of us that receive uh, more spiritual light, we will be held more responsible. Right? So if I go out into the world after service, and I wouldn't do this, but um, I robbed a bank, right? and I got away with it. And I get to heaven and like God's like, you robbed the bank. I'd be like, well, you know, I, I just was kind of short on cash and I, I didn't really know. And he'd say, Joe, I know you read Genesis to Revelation. Don't tell me you didn't know. So the thing is for folks like us, right, we don't get a pass. We've received more spiritual light in the form of his word and his, his uh, leadings from the Holy Spirit. So we will be held more accountable. So without Christ, we are in a lot of trouble. Right? You know, some even rely today on their traditions and their culture. They, they have this, this, again, it's another crutch, it's another rubber crutch that they try to lean on. You know, and, and it could be a dead tradition or an, an old culture that doesn't glorify God. I've seen it with, you know, people from my own ethnicity, and boy, can they be stubborn. And I try to talk to them about what the truth of what, what God says in His Word. And it can be difficult. People are set in their ways. But that's the beauty of the Bible because it breaks through that, that concrete headedness and, and it reaches down into our heart. Some have to actively fight the preaching or the hearing of the word with God trying to reach them and they find themselves almost doing battle. Maybe even during a sermon. Maybe even get annoyed with the pastor. You know, like what he says. It's not that they don't like me or any other pastors. It's they don't like the material, right? So God's Word is either going to harden the heart or it's going to soften the heart. Which one will it be for you if you don't know the Lord yet? 14 through 16, interesting conversation. Goes back to the first part of the chapter. Nobody has an excuse or a privilege over another person. Remember, God is a fair God. We look out into our culture and we see different standards of justice. We see different standards of who's going to be forgiven for this and who's not. But it doesn't work like that in God's economy. And that's why I love him, because he's fair. People aren't fair, but God is fair. Even to the churchgoer, is it enough to just come to church? Well, if you don't have a relationship with the Lord, it doesn't really mean much. Are you moving in that direction? Right? Even some have criticized the altar call and said, well, why do you do this thing at the end of service where somebody walks up to receive Jesus? Because if they truly are coming up because God has stirred up their heart and they want to proclaim that they want Jesus, then that's a wonderful thing. Can some people come up with an emotional experience and their heart really isn't for the Lord? Can some people come up thinking that Jesus is a piggy bank and if I get Jesus, my financial problems are over? Would they come up and, and maybe they're not doing a great job working on their marriage, but if they think they come up that Jesus is going to magically fix their marriage? If these are the reasons, then yes, coming up is really not, it's really not genuine. What's genuine is to come up, to know that Christ died for your sins, to trust in that sacrifice, to believe, right? And to give your heart to Him and start walking with Him, to have a relationship. If somebody comes up like three years ago, and we all knew they came up, but they came up again today, I would be like, that's awesome. I would assume that now the light bulb went off, it's for real. Same thing with baptism. I was baptized as an infant, probably six months old. I don't, there was no pictures. I was told that it happened. There's a certificate in my parents' house somewhere. But they did it against my will. That wasn't really nice. They probably sprinkled water on my face as a baby. I was probably having a bad day. I probably screamed. Didn't know what they were doing to me. See, baptism is, and I'm being funny and nobody's laughing, so that happens sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> baptism is something you do because you've trusted in Christ and you want pretty much as a public uh, uh, proclamation that you, you want to be immersed in the water. You want to give up your old life. You want to walk in newness of life. You want to identify with Christ's resurrection. So, for me, I was told I was baptized as a baby. Don't remember it. Maybe it was traumatic. But I also did it when I was an adult and became a born-again Christian. I got baptized in the ocean. That had incredible significance for me. 
right? So if you say, why would you, are we supposed to get baptized twice? Well, if the first time it didn't mean anything, if the first time you truly weren't sold out for Christ, then yeah, you should get baptized the second time. So we'll, we'll see what happens today at the service. It's a timely message, uh, certainly. But, you know, we can, listen, this thing with Jesus is, a, that's why it's called a walk. A walk. Today we you know, we have all kinds of equipment, we fly, we get on trains and buses and cars, and we drive everywhere, and we bicycle. In this culture, all they did was walk. They walked for exercise, they walked for fellowship, they walked to get to another place. So when you look at these analogies in Scripture, a daily walk with the Lord, people walked like 90% of the day. And God was saying, I want to be with you wherever you are, I want to walk with you. Isn't that neat? Most people haven't heard about this personal relationship. They see religion, they see church, they see rites, they see rituals, they see denominations that fight with each other, and they don't get it because, sadly, somebody hasn't explained it to them. It's a walk with your Creator. He loves us that much that He didn't set us free as free moral agent and, and then disappear for eternity. It's not what He does. He's there, you know? Do you want a walk with your Creator? It's a wonderful experience, and it's, it's a lifelong experience. You're never alone at that point. Verse 16, he says that the Lord will judge the secrets of men and women. God's not fooled by outward appearance, false motives, or pretense. And let's, let's boil down this whole thing with the law, and I'll just do an illustration. To me, the law, right? What are you talking about, Pastor Joe? Well, you can talk about the Ten Commandments. You can talk about the Scripture. You can talk about the Bible, which is God's Word, the prophetic works, right? Does that fix us when we read it? It doesn't. The law, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, you should do this, you should do that, is really like a mirror. And everybody looks pretty good today. You're all looking pretty fly. That's a word from the 70s and 80s. Um, <laughs> I'm dating myself. So, well, what did everybody do this morning? I would imagine that all of you, including myself, got up, looked at one of the mirrors in our houses, and said, man, I don't look so good after sleeping seven or eight hours. So the law is like a mirror. It shows us the dirt. It shows us the filth. It shows us the unkemptness. So I'm making the analogy with sin. Right? When we look at ourselves in the mirror, the law shows us that we're sinners. It shows us where we fall flat. Now, can you take this mirror? Did anybody do this this morning? Please raise your hand, and then I'll have you committed. Um, <laughs> did anybody this morning take a mirror and rub it all over their face and their hair, and then all of a sudden they look good? Not one person. Because that's not what the mirror is for, and that's not what the law is for. The law doesn't fix sin. It reveals sin. You know what fixes sin? You know what fixes dirtiness in a physical application? Is this bar of soap. Oh, so fresh and clean. I could do a commercial. But when you take the soap and you wash your hands and you put it on your face, and you still use a mirror. Why? Because when you wash your face, what do you always get? Those little pieces of soap by your ears? and the chin that you didn't see when you washed your face, and then you wash it again until all those little white bubbly suds are gone. So the mirror shows you what the bar of soap did. And by parallel, Jesus is the bar of soap. The law says, I can only do so much. I can only reveal. And you say, well, gee, I'm still in sin. How do I get to heaven? That's where Jesus comes in. He's the only one who can fix the problems. And when God sees our face, He sees it clean. He doesn't see the blemishes. What happened? The soap took it away. When Jesus died on the cross, what He did was He took the punishment for sin because sin deserves punishment. So that when He took our sinful identity, so when God sees, when God saw Him, I'm quick, when God saw Him on the cross, He saw all of our sinfulness. When God saw us after the cross and after our belief in Christ, He saw Christ's cleanliness. Pretty neat, isn't it? So that's a, an, a, an analogy, and you know we're going to speak a lot about the law. And a lot of people ask me, what does the law do? And now you have your answer. 
And this is the beauty of coming to any, not just Calvary, any Bible teaching church because it helps us to understand what God wants us to know. Verse 17, it says, Indeed, Apostle Paul continues, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor to the, of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. You almost see a setup here with the Apostle Paul. He's speaking to his, his clique, his people, uh, who unfortunately have given themselves into self-righteousness. We're chosen, we have the law, the Gentiles, there, and they, there was some derogatory things that were said about the Gentiles back then. Uh, so Paul's saying, you know, you're, you're the smart ones. You have the law, you're the teachers, you have the light. Watch what happens in verse 21. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you as it is written. Now that comes from Isaiah and Ezekiel, and I'll explain. So two out of four is practice what you preach. And we hear that a lot even today. Practice what you preach. This is powerful. Preaching is a spiritual gift, but when we preach, we also have to examine our own lives. It's something that we always have to do. Uh, and there's context here. But you can see a parallel today. I wonder in 2,000 years, has the human race become more spiritual? Have we evolved spiritually? And I think the answer is no. With all the intellect and all the study and all, you still have hypocrisy. You still have people that judge. You still have people acting like Pharisees. So yes, we can make the application then, but we can also make it today. Verses 17 through 20, he's speaking, he hammers the self-righteous, right? He says, you preach, but do you listen to what you preach? Do you follow? Do you practice what you preach? He said, you robbed, do you rob temples? Now, there's some speculation of what he meant. I don't want to get into all the, the details, but um, you know, maybe it has to do with religious graft. And every so often we see on the news another, I don't know, clergy leader who got busted stealing money from their church or this or that. Did they read this? <laughs> so, I mean, what's really changed in 2,000 years? Now, religious, religion can be the worst. The religious can be the worst. And, and don't get me wrong. If you're into religion, people say, that's weird that you're saying that. I'm looking at a pulpit. There's a cross outside the building. There's a church. But religion doesn't save. What we preach here is a relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, I do, I do hospital visits, and my pastors do hospital visits, and elders, and... Uh, I remember going to, I always follow the rules. I'll wait online, I show my clergy ID, there's like a procedure. And I remember one day a lady said to me at the desk, she goes, you're clergy? I'm like, yeah, why? She goes, they never follow the rules. And I said, well, I'm here to follow the rules and I'm sorry about that. I don't know who she was talking about, but it just set a bad hypocritical example. Well, we're clergy, we can just come in here to the hospital, do what we want, give us free parking, um, and, this, and you're gonna like it. I'll give you another example. And, and again, it's sad. This is what keeps people away from church. This is what keeps people away from God. So years ago, I was a police officer, and I get a call. I'm in a full uniform. I'm on patrol, and they said there's um, a disturbance or a chaotic situation on Route 1 in Sand Hill. If you're familiar with that area, it's, it's a multi-lane highway, bad visibility. It's on the top of a hill. There's a McDonald's and a Burger King, there's cross streets. It's just a nightmare normally. And I pull up and I see all these people with cans collecting stuff. It turns out they were all like volunteering and collecting for a church at the worst possible time. People were beeping, they were almost getting hit. So I get out of the car and I'm like, Who, who's the leader here? So they point to the pastor. So me and the pastor are talking. He's giving me a hard time. And uh, I'm trying to be nice and stuff. And, you know, he really wants to do this thing and blah, blah, blah. And I was explaining him the township ordinances and the laws and stuff. So I was getting nowhere. Now, he judged me. I was wearing a uniform, right? So I said, hmm, doesn't it say in Romans 13 that we're supposed to be subject to the laws of the governing authorities if it doesn't go against God? He goes, 
we're going to pack up. Have a nice day, officer. <laughs> you know, I didn't have to use any of the equipment on my belt. I didn't have to use the bullhorn. Uh, I poked him with my sword, which is the sword of, of the word of the Lord. And he was probably shocked that it came out of my mouth because he judged my appearance. And uh, they packed up and they left. It was like magic. So, <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, and again, I'm not trying to turn people off who are really into their religion, but if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, it's a false foundation. People come to this church, we do things, we have fun, we have ordinances, but that doesn't save us. It's a personal relationship with Christ that saves us. In verse 24, the Apostle Paul, uh, is he being mean-spirited? No, he's actually quoting Ezekiel 36 and Isaiah 52, where God, through these prophets, said to the Jewish people in the Old Testament, you can find an Old Testament, I don't care who puts it out, if the quote is in there from God, he basically says, you're supposed to win the Gentiles to me, but you guys are turning off the Gentiles. Your behavior is hypocritical. You know, it's funny, people who are unbelievers are not stupid. And sometimes they can smell hypocrisy. So he basically says, they see your hypocrisy and you're supposed to be representing me and you're making me look bad and I don't like it. God said this to his own people. But then the question is, how many times have self-professed Christians turned off unbelievers from God? I have a full confession that when I first got saved, I was overzealous. I was so excited that I turned people off. And I had to say to myself, I'm not winning anybody to the kingdom and uh, I really should change my ways and take it down a little bit. I can be very hyper. What a surprise, right? So, um, so I had to change the way I did things because the last thing that I wanted was to turn people off to God. But it still happens, you know? We can go through that in an immature stage as Christians, but some people never get out of that stage. So whether we're talking about the Old Testament believers or even today, it, the loss, it, the word still stands. It still has meaning. Now, what do we come to up until this point? Well, he says, for, for you that preach don't commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You know what Jesus taught us in Matthew 5 and the Sermon on the Mount? And a lot of people romanticize the Bible. Oh, you know, I saw a picture of Jesus on the hill preaching to the masses and it warmed my heart. Did you read Matthew 5? No, but I saw this really nice print. Okay, read Matthew 5. When Jesus was preaching, he preached in love, but he also preached things that were convicting, that opened people's eyes, you know, that had that mirror that showed them that they're not as clean as they think they are. In Matthew 5, what Jesus showed us is it's not only the action that's a sin, it's the thought. When I read that for the first time, I felt like I got punched in the stomach. I'm a new believer. I never really read the Sermon on the Mount. I read it and I'm like, oh, wow. Even the thoughts, the, the thoughts of anger towards another person. He says, you've, you've injured them. You've murdered them in your heart. The rich young ruler, Jesus, I've, I've, I've kept all these commandments. And Jesus basically told them, hey, uh, young man, you, you have issues with idolatry. You love money. So get rid of the money because it's, it's dragging you down. He couldn't do that. He walked away. So what, what we were shown through the Sermon on the Mount is that it's not just our outward actions, but it's our, our heart, what we think, what we harbor inside that condemn us. And it would almost seem like the situation is hopeless. The situation actually is hopeless, but it leads us like the mirror to the Savior. We're dirty, and rub the mirror on your face all day long. It isn't going to fix the problem. You need that bar of soap. You need that Savior. Verse 25 through 29, <clears throat> the good news is at the end. For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. It's kind of become reversed, which makes no sense if it's done physically, if you think about it. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? Remember, he's taking a physical act and he's making a spiritual parallel. This is why even some churches, they just, you know, they're just like, well, we're going to stay away from Romans. Why? Let's teach Romans. Let's understand Romans. So that we, we go out into the world, we, we are armed, right? We have our sword. We, in a spiritual sense, you know, we can break down strongholds, as the scripture tells us. But he continues, and will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you 
even with your written code and circumcision, who are a transgressor of the law. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, just the act of circumcision, nor is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew or a believer, a true believer, who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not from men but from God. So this is pretty heavy. This is three, circumcision of a heart. What, it, what does it really mean? So I'm sure we're all familiar with the act. Um, a lot of people, they're baby boys. They have them circumcised, the flesh. Um, the foreskin doesn't really do much. It's, it's cut, and people do it for different reasons, and it's thrown in the garbage. What God said to his people or the men was, you need to do this not because of any other reason, but because it's a sign, it's a covenant between me and you, and what it shows is that you've cut away dead flesh that does nothing for you. So the parallel is, when you think about it, I want you also to work it out in your heart. I want you to get rid of those things in your life that are the old man, the old life of the flesh, right? To walk in the spirit, to walk in newness of life. That simple act had a very powerful uh, symbolism and significance. And we see a parallel, right, with Christians in baptism. <laughs> Pretty amazing how the Bible kind of comes full circle is baptism, there's so much to baptism, and if you stay for the baptisms, I'll explain more. I'm not going to go through all of it, but baptism was something where you, you believe and you trust in Christ, right? But when you are completely immersed and dunked into the water and you you come out you come out you like bury the old life of the flesh think about the circumcision and you come out in the life of the spirit and newness of life now does baptism save anybody no it doesn't remember the thief on the cross in Luke I believe it was 23 24 the thief on the cross he's dying and he turns to Jesus at his last moments and Jesus says today you will be with me in paradise so that thief didn't get a chance to be baptized. He didn't get a chance to speak in tongues. He didn't get a chance to write a check to the church. He didn't get a chance to go door to door. None of those things. But that man, when his heart stopped beating, was with the Lord in paradise. Amazing. So that kind of kills some of these false teachings out there with all these rites and rituals and rules and just, you know, sometimes even bigger than the Bible. And who could read all that stuff? And who would want to follow all that stuff? What does the Word say? So, but baptism is a sign, like circumcision in the Old Testament was a sign that I am following Jesus. I want to bury my old life. Does it mean that we're going to be perfect? No. Does it mean that, you know, when I found that when I became a Christian, some sins went quickly, and others are still became a struggle. Um, no person, I don't care how long they live on the earth and how long they're a Christian, no person is sinless. Right? That is going to come later. Right? God is going to perfect us. Right now, he came to work on bringing us into the kingdom. Verse 27, this is powerful. It's terse. It's convicting. And he says to those who were, you know, again, self-righteous, they had the law, they had the circumcision. He says, well, not the physically uncircumcised. Those people that you look down on, if he fulfills the law, remember we talked about judging initially in this chapter. If he fulfills the law, will he not judge you even with your written code and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? So the tables are kind of turned here and the bottom line, folks, is we, we really should practice what we preach. You know, What we read, what we hear, do we do it? Do we apply it? Right. What does Jesus say in John 14? Conditional statement. If you love me, you will give money to the church. You will go door to door. No, that stuff's not in there. If you love me, follow my word. That's what he says. If you love me. Oh, I love Jesus. I have these feelings that are fluttering in my heart. Feelings are great. But are your feelings based on reality? Do we really love Jesus? If we flaunt his God's, God's word and we don't try and we don't want to change and we want to be set in our ways, well, guess what? We don't really love him, no matter what our lips say. And how do we follow his word? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit 
has been given to us. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 1.22, I believe. And what happens is Holy Spirit guides us. He fills us. He teaches us. He convicts us when needed. This is like a part of God writing, uh, not writing, but uh, living inside of us. Neat stuff here. Four out of four. What is the proper foundation? Let's turn to Matthew 7, 24 through 27 as we close for this morning. We talked about all kinds of false foundations. We looked at the pictures of the buildings and the homes that were leaning and they were sinking and they were breaking apart. Jesus says this, parable of the two builders. Now there is, think of the leaning power, tower of Pisa, there is a physical application, but of course Jesus' parables were all about us getting the spiritual implications. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings, he would teach and teach and teach. And some people, they like the free food, they like the miracles, they like the crowds, just like churchgoers today. Some churchgoers. But he said to them, what are you going to do with my teachings? Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the wind blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. Now everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. The same trials, the same outside influences, and it fell, and great was its fall. Folks, why does God remind us? Why does God warn us? Why does God give us some things in Scripture that make us cringe sometimes? There's a whole slew of churches out there that completely omit parts of the Bible that they refuse to teach because it doesn't bring the people in and it doesn't bring the money in. And they are false prophets. I don't care how many people are jumping up and down, yelling and screaming. If they're omitting the scripture, if they're omitting the word and just preaching the popular parts, they are not being true to God's word. So, in closing, false foundations, there's plenty. I listed about a dozen. You could probably give me another hundred. They're all out there into this world. This world is a perilous place. But there's only one foundation that will keep us stable in this life and the next, and that's Jesus Christ, the rock. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your fire and your word. Thank you that you've raised up people that have the same passion for your word and for truth and seeing people saved, Lord, that you do. Father, help us to be faithful as we read the scripture and apply it to our lives. Help us to see the mirror to see where we lack, and to get more of the soap, to have more of Jesus, to have more of the Holy Spirit, to help us live the life that you've called us to live. And I would just ask right now, as the worship team comes up to lead us in closing worship, is there anybody here who does not know Jesus when you walked into this building, but you have a desire for him now? You have read the Bible and you said, you know, I've never really read that portion of Scripture, like me as a young man. If that's your desire, just take a walk up to the front. We'll lead you in a prayer. If that's your heart, we can't get you into heaven. That's between you and your Creator. We're just here to facilitate. So if that's your desire, I don't care if you're really young or really advanced in years, you come forward. Maybe somebody will walk up with you. Give your heart to Jesus today. It doesn't mean that you have to be a part of the church as an organization, but you're a part of His church, the body of believers that will be there for all eternity. You come if that's your desire.